Hello and welcome to this homework help video. We're going to look at two problems, each that has three parts. So we got problem one and problem two. So one and two. In both problems, they are at least tangentially related to the topic of electromagnetism, which is the combination of magnetic physics or the study of magnetism along with electricity and how the two interact, how they are directly related to each other. The first problem is all about transformers, okay? So this would be under the key term of transformers. A transformer is a pair, on the fundamental level, it's a pair of coils, coiled current-carrying wires, and those two coils don't make any physical contact, so there's no conduction between them, but there's electromagnetic induction between the two coils. And what all transformers do via those two side-by-side -side coils is they either step up or step down the voltage. So they change the voltage, which means they also change the current. And I mentioned that because in the second problem, we're going to have a problem that involves using Ohm's law as well as the power law, which is all content that is in the previous chapter. But importantly, it implies the usefulness or application of a transformer. So in that sense, although it's review material in terms of its equations, it's a nice conceptual connection and makes you care about transformers as you see what they are at least partially useful for. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at our calculations in our first problem. All right, so let's read the initial statement right up top. An ideal transformer, which means it has no internal resistance, so the wires are perfect for our um, purposes, think of them as superconductors, has 50 turns in its primary, when it says primary, it means primary coil, and 400 turns in its secondary, secondary coil. All right, so essentially we have, and excuse my bad artistry, have two coils, so we would have a primary coil with many, many turns, so that is supposed to represent our 50 turns, although that is the smaller of the two numbers. So this is 50 turns in the primary coil. And then we're going to have a secondary coil that's right next to it. And we'll uh, draw that in a different color. So let's go ahead and put our secondary coil here. And this one, I'll try to make it look like it has more turns. But of course, I'm not drawing all 150 of them. All right, so that is our transformer composed of two, coil, two coils. What about that? So we have our two, coil, two coils, there we are. So 150, okay, turns in the secondary. Okay. And our equation for working with transformers tells us that there will be a reciprocal relationship between voltage and number of turns. And so what the key equation looks like for transformers is the following. And this is the really the one new equation for transformers. You could call it the transformer equation. And it states that the voltage of the primary, which I'm going to call 1, over the voltage in the secondary, which we'll call 2, is then equal to the reciprocal of the number of coils. So then we'll have N1 and N2. Now, I don't have it in front of me, and often I derive this equation from conservation of energy via conservation of power. That's a, a way that I can always make sure I have it right. I also know that if you have more coils in the secondary, then that is a step up transformer. Because as you go up in coils, you also go up in voltage. So I want to make sure I have this right and I'm not thinking of it the wrong way. So if I look over here and I solve for V1, then it's going to be V1 is going to be N2 over N1. So there's more coils in N2 then V1 will be greater. Ah, so it is, it, these actually need to be directly related then, like so. All right, so I'm correcting the equation here because I had, I had a feeling that it might, I may have written it incorrectly, 
Now, I kept mentioning a reciprocal relationship, although actually we can see it's a direct relationship or direct proportionality between voltage and number of coils, okay? So let's go ahead and use this equation with algebra to solve for our unknown. And what is our unknown? Well, we're given the number of turns, which I wrote, and our last piece of information is we're told that there's 15 volts in the primary, okay? You can think of that as the input voltage. Now, voltage is always a difference because it's like an altitude, if we're drawing analogies between mechanics and electricity. So this is our 15 volts. It mentions it's AC, which means alternating current. It has to be. Direct current doesn't induce a current in a secondary coil. You have to have a changing current to create a changing magnetic field to induce that current. That is called Faraday's law, and it's part of the fundamental laws behind the scenes here. Point being, it has to be AC. It would never work without AC, okay? DC, like a battery, would not power this transformer. It wouldn't make this transformer work. All right, so let's go ahead with that piece of information. We realize that there's only one unknown, which is the voltage in the secondary coil. And I bet that's what we're asked for, of course. What is the voltage available in the secondary coil? In, you know, yes, available, right? Because you can draw on that voltage to power something, okay? So that means that our algebra would be simply solving for V2. So we're going to show our algebraic step here. All right, so algebra to solve for the secondary voltage, the voltage in the secondary coil. So we want to multiply and, you know, isolate that variable. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides of the equation by V2 because that is going to get V2 out of the denominator and in the numerator. Of course, it's getting into the other side of the equation, but we'll have a second step to find it, right, or to get it by itself. So V2 will cancel on the, on the left-hand side, and we'll just be left with that V2 on the right-hand side. So now our equation has become V1 equals N1 over N2 V2. And you might think to yourself, oh, well, you know, you've made a mistake because you solved for V1. Well, I'm just getting there. And now I want to multiply both sides by the reciprocal of my fraction so that I can get V2 by itself. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides of the equation by N2 over N1, so over here as well, N2 over N1. And as you see, that will cancel out the N1s and N2s on the right, leaving V1 all by itself, just like we wanted to. And we'll write it like this. So now we've solved for, or I said V1, I would say V2 all by itself, like we wanted. And we'll leave the input voltage out front. So I'm just reordering the order of terms, and then N2 over N1, okay? So now our equation is ready to use. Let's go ahead and plug in our numbers, and then we'll plug them into the calculator to get a numerical value. So then I have V1, and I'm gonna go with 15 volts. And let's go ahead and actually change a couple of our numbers here. Let's make this one 28 volts, just so I'm not using the numbers in the online system. And then, oh, well, interestingly, I don't know where I got that 150 from. I obviously just made that number up or misread the 15. So we'll go ahead and make that change official and make that 150 turns in the secondary coil and 50 in the primary. So it, it's still a step up transformer because there's more turns in the secondary coil than the primary. So we will get a V2 that's larger than V1. All right, so let's put in our 15 volts, our input voltage in the primary coil. And then our, our fraction here, which is the ratio of the coils. So 150, all right, there's no units on that. So it's just 150, it's 150 turns over 50. So 150 over 50 is just three because 150 goes in to, or uh, rather 50 goes in 153 times. So we're just gonna get three times 15, which we can actually just do in our heads because that's 45, okay? So our final answer is 45 volts. Okay, let's take a look at part B. So in part B, we're asked, what is the current in an eight ohm device connected to the secondary? So this is all review now. This is not using electromagnetism, but just applying Ohm's law, okay? 
And let's go ahead and have our device that is drawing power from the secondary coil, right? Because drawing voltage ultimately will manifest itself as drawing power. That's why I say that. But it's also, you can think of it as drawing voltage or current, really, right? Either way, right? It's connected to a voltage. It's drawing current. It's drawing power. These are all ways to say the same physical thing. Um, anyway, so we have a current that we're trying to find. And let's have our device be a 20 ohm device. All right. So that's its resistance. Okay. And we don't know what it is, right? It could be like a light bulb, for example, or something, right? Something that is, it uses resistance to, you know, do something useful, create visible light. Okay. And if it was something like a heater, we probably have a much higher resistance, right? And it probably require higher voltage as well. So let's go ahead and just use Ohm's law to solve for it. So our, our key equation here is Ohm's law, which I haven't written yet. So let's write this down. So key, a key, not key Ohm, but key equation. Okay is Ohm's law, okay, that's the name of it. And what it looks like is just V equals IR. So voltage is equal to the product of current and resistance, okay? That's what the equation tells us, fundamental law, very, Basic law, but really useful law. And we want to solve for I, and we know V because the V here is V2. So we're going to go ahead and just solve directly for that, right, with an algebraic step, which only involves dividing both sides by R, okay? So we're just going to divide both sides, of course, I mean sides of the equation, by R, okay? So if I divide the right-hand side by R as well as the left-hand side, of course the R is going to cancel on the right, and I'm just gonna be left with a new equation that says that I equals V over R, which sometimes you'll even see written as Ohm's law, right? Because it is, it's a pretty simple law that you can rearrange often in your head. And so there you have the Ohm's law written as current, right? Solved for current. And let's go ahead and numerically find our current with our value. Remember, V here is V2. So we're going to have 45 volts. And then we're going to divide by the chosen resistance of 20 ohms. And I won't, I won't do that one in my head, but I can see that it's going to be something just over 2. But let's see what it is. So 45 divided by 20, 2.25. So 2 and a quarter. That makes sense, actually. All right. And that is going to be the current. Everything was in base units, namely ohms and volts. So that means our current is going to be 2.25, well, the base units of current amps. So 2.25A. Finally, we're asked to find the power, okay? So what is the power supplied to the primary? Well, the power supplied to the primary is the same as the power drawn from the secondary because that's the key thing about a lot of physics is that you can have some sort of changed quantity, like a force in a lever or a hydraulic device that employs Pascal's principle. Why am I mentioning this mechanical stuff? Well, because a transformer kind of is, is like a electrical lever because it has a increase in voltage. It does that at the cost of current. So you lose current, but sometimes you want that. And furthermore, it doesn't change energy energy must be conserved. Now in a non-ideal transformer, energy is conserved in a broader sense. Some of it is converted to heat, but here we're not worried about that. We're just wor worried or concerned about 100% conservation of energy between the two coils. So whatever power goes in the primary, it's the same as the power in the secondary. So that means that this question, as for the power in the primary, which might give you pause and make you think, how are you gonna find that? Well, all you need to find is the power that our 20 ohm you know, device is drawing, that pow the power that's drawing, and that's our answer, okay? So we're gonna use the power law, that's our only key equation, okay? You may recall this in the previous chapter, the power law that is, and that just says that P, power, electrical power, is just the product of current and voltage. And I'll write it more like I wrote Ohm's law. And don't get these two mixed up, obviously, right? Because they, you know, they give us their different quantities, obviously they're both very simple equations, but Whereas Ohm's law tells us that voltage is the product of current and resistance, the power law tells us that power is the product of current and voltage. 
Now, you can use Ohm's law to rewrite the power law because you only need to know two out of those three quantities, those three quantities being current, voltage, and resistance, all right? And let's go ahead and do that because we want to go ahead and just find the power. We so far know the current and, well, actually, we know the current, we know the resistance, and we know the voltage, so we could use any of them. Um, but I could go ahead and rewrite the power law by combining it with Ohm's law. So by combining with Ohm's law, I can do what's called a substitution and replace V with IR, because by definition, V is IR, specifically by the law, right, by Ohm's law. So that means that we would just have that the power is I times I R, see? It's a rewritten form of the power law. And that, since there's an I, and this is all just multiplication, we could get rid of the parentheses and it, could, it would just become I I R. But when you have two I's, there's two equal terms multiplied by each other, well, that's just I squared. So you'll see this written every time as I squared times R, see? Okay, now of course you can also write it just in terms of voltage and resistance, and I'll leave that up to you. But let's go ahead then and use this law with our values, and we can use it in this new form, because we know the current is going to be the value that we found before of 2.25. Okay, so 2.25 amps. Okay, and then we're going to go ahead and square that and multiply by the resistance of our device, which was our 20 ohms. All right, so that's going to be our power. We'll do this right here. 2.25, easy number, just copy over. So I didn't bother to label it as a variable or anything. Don't forget to square it and then multiply by 20. So we have 101 watts of power, which we'll just round to 100 because we're dealing with two significant, two significant figures, not, not three, or it'd be a 101. It, the program will accept 101, by the way, if you're doing this in an online homework system. Okay, so that is it for problem one. We can go ahead and zoom out and see our steps here. And we can see that we use three key, three key equations, the transformer equation, Ohm's law, and the power law. Okay, so now let's take a look at number two. Now in number two, problem number two, we're told that a pair of 60 kilowatt, or a power, we'll get to a pair in a second, a power of 60 kilowatts, which is 60,000 watts, is delivered to the other side of a city by a pair of power lines, between which the voltage is 12,000 volts. So that's because one of them is the incoming power line and the other is the outgoing power line. So if we were to draw this, this might, this might look something like this. So we'd have the incoming line, all right? So this would be the current coming into the city. So I for current, and this will be our city here. All right. And, right, is delivered to the other side of the city by a pair of power lines, yeah. And then we'd have the outgoing over here. So I guess, the way it's written, it says to the other side of the city, but I'm thinking of this maybe just coming from the power plant, right? So rather, you know, but there could be city in between. Point being is that here is the power plant. Whether that's, you know, outside the city or within the city, it doesn't matter. We just have some sort of current going in, current coming out. There has to be a voltage difference because the city is part of a circuit. So you can think of this as all just one big circuit with the source of energy being the power plant, like a battery is a source of energy, the city drawing on that energy, and to be part, you know, to get electricity, there always has to be a complete loop. We call it a circuit for a reason, right? Because it has to finish, otherwise it's a broken circuit, and there would be no energy, right? No useful energy that can be drawn. So there has to be a voltage difference. So the voltage difference is the voltage difference, uh, really, that the power plant creates, which is, also the voltage difference between the incoming and outgoing wires. So this is our delta V, okay? That is our voltage, okay? And we have that voltage as 12,000 volts, all right? And let's change that number slightly. Let's make it 36,000. 
okay? And we'll uh, keep the power at 60,000 watts, okay? Very good, and I'm also going to clarify some notation here. Delta V makes sense because it's a difference of voltage, but I don't wanna to have to write that every time. So I'm just gonna call my Delta V V, which is pretty common practice because voltages are always differences. So calling attention to them as being a delta is often redundant, unnecessary. So we'll just call it a voltage, okay? So that's gonna be our 36,000. That's gonna be the letter V, okay? So we're told what formula to use. We're gonna use what I call the power law, okay? What I've been calling the power law. So this is our power law right here, P equals IV. And we're told to use that in order to find the current. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. This should be a direct process because we know two of the variables, we just don't know I, okay? So we're going to take the equation and just solve it, solve for I. So I'm gonna take the power law and solve for current I to get the actual current that's flowing through that wire. So that is gonna simply be a matter of dividing both sides by V. So I'm not gonna show it this time. I'll just cut corners because I think you get it and you can think of it and try it yourself. And it's very similar to what we did above. So our current is just going to be power divided by voltage. So let's go ahead and plug in our numbers or write it out and then actually plug them in the calculator. So the current that we're gonna be solving for is going to be our 60,000 watts up top so that's gonna be 6.0 times 10 to the four watts, written in scientific notation, divided by 36,000 volts, which I'll just write as 3.6 times 10 to the four volts. Okay, so 60,000 divided by 36,000. One thing you can actually do is just cancel out the tens to the four because it's the same number of tens in the numerator and the denominator. So it would just work out to be six over 3.6, right? So six divided by 3.6, and that's just gonna be 1.6 repeating, right? So that's just one and two thirds, and I'm gonna write it as 1.7. So we have 1.7, what are our units? Amps, because we, we had everything in base units, thanks to paying attention to all the powers of 10. So 1.7 amps is our answer. Okay, so that's pretty low current, right? And I just bring this up because I said that there would be a conceptual connection between the transformer and this, you know, this idea of the you know, power lines here, which is really just a basic circuit using Ohm's law. Well, here's the idea, is there's really high voltage in the real world in long distance power lines or power lines that power a whole city like these, because that means that there's low current. If there's high voltage, then there has to be low current. We see that right here in this relationship between power, current, and voltage. You can't have high current and high voltage. And if your current was really large, then your voltage would actually be small for a fixed amount of power, right? So if I wanted to deliver a lot of power to the city, which seems like a reasonable demand, then I would either need high voltage or high current or fairly high of both, right? Because you're multiplying them together. So why do we design our cities to have very high voltage and low current. Well, here we do it for a very specific reason. And we do it with transformers. And we do it for the reason that we'll see in the numbers that come out of part A and part C. Okay, so part B and part C, excuse me. So when we, when we look at the values we're gonna get, we're gonna see that thanks to this small, quite, you know, quite small current that's going through this very high voltage, high power, line, power line, well, that means that there's going to be not a lot of loss of energy to the inevitable resistance in that power line. If you think about power lines that travel many miles between cities, right, many kilometers between cities, well, that means that inevitably, no matter how good that, wi that wire is in terms of what it's made out of and how well it's insulated, it will lose some power, okay, it will have some resistance and some heat will be dissipated. Well, if your current is small, then the amount of energy that gets dissipated as heat is also small. That's why we want high voltage in long distance power lines. That's why we call them high voltage power lines because they are high voltage 
And the reason they are is because they need to be low current so as not to lose as much energy through inevitable resistance. You see it? And how do we do that? How do we get that high voltage? We use a transformer. So at the power plant, there would be a step up transformer that would step up the voltage from whatever, it, whatever it's being generated at by, due to the mechanisms of the, the power generation, whether it's you know, hydroelectric or nuclear or coal, whatever. There's gonna be some sort of generation of electricity through some spinning coils of wire within magnetic fields at the fundamental level, right? Usually, usually through the boiling of water that then, you know, that turns turbines. Well, then that, whatever that voltage is, is not gonna be that high, but then we'll step it up, right? The designers of the system will step it up and make it very high, such as 36,000 volts, okay? Makes them dangerous, yes, but comes at a huge cost saving, right, you know, outcome. All right, so hopefully that all makes sense. Let's finally run our numbers in part B and part C. So if each of the two lines has a resistance of 13 ohms, and let's make this even a little bit bigger to justify our very small current in our super high voltage, let's make this um, uh, 55 ohms, okay? And we could just imagine these lines are really long, right? So never leave have a, a large amount of resistance, okay? And then it says, find the change of voltage along each line. Obviously, this we can't just use the voltage we were given before, so it's a different voltage in 36,000. And we're reminded of that in this in this little parenthetical statement that says, think carefully, right? A little warning here. This voltage change is along each line, not between the lines. Okay? So how do we find it? Well, now what we're going to use is Ohm's law. Okay? So we're going to have V, okay, and I'm going to call this V lost. Think of this as the voltage drop due to resistance. And that's just going to be I times R. Okay, just the product of I and R with that resistance, right? The internal resistance being the value of 55 ohms and I being the current that we solved for using the power law up above, all right? So now we can just plug in our numbers and our V is going to be our 1.7 ohms multiplied by the, one, excuse me, 1.7 amps multiplied by the 50 ohms of resistance in the wire, all right? And you know, obviously you wanna have as, as low resistance as possible when you design a wire to carry electricity, and not just lose energy to heat. And it's going to be 85 volts, okay? So that's going to be our answer. We'll go ahead and put that over here, 85 volts, okay? And then finally, we're asked, find what is the power expended as heat in both lines together, distinct from the power delivered to customers, okay? Now, it would come out of that power, okay? So the, it, you, if you wanted to then think about the the gross power being what you want to deliver, and the net power being the gross power minus the power loss to, to heat, right, and the resistance of the wire, then it would just simply be the 60,000 watts minus whatever we get in part C, okay? All right, so what we're gonna use is the power law. So we're gonna use that same equation again, so no new equations here, as I think I mentioned a few minutes ago, and it's just gonna be I times V, okay? And the I will be the 1.7 amps. The V will be the 85 volts we just found, okay? And so then what that's gonna look like in terms of the power lost, okay? It will be our P, that's our power lost, will be our 85 um, volts, but we'll put that next. So we'll put the 1.7 amps first, to stick in the same order as written, multiplied by the 85 volts. Okay, so then we'll have that 1.7, if I'm rounding here, times 85, 144 watts. So 140, um, I, I guess it would round, yeah, it would probably round down, so 140 watts. Well, there we have it. You can see it's a small number compared to the 60,000 watts delivered, thanks to the high voltage and low current. Right? See it? That's why the high voltage was necessary so that this value was suitably small. And we did that, or we would do that with a transformer. So conceptually, our two problems are connected. They also were in terms of reusing Ohm's law on the power law. And the one new key equation that you saw was the transformer equation. I hope this homework help video has been helpful. Thank you so much for watching.